what we're looking in March in our Wednesdays at more than conquerors, how we as God's people are called to be a victorious people. We, we have struggles, we have hardships, but by and large what we are in Christ are, are conquerors. And we've looked at this through looking at different individuals, different stories. Last week, Ricky uh, showed us the book of Ruth and how Ruth's story is a love story, but a a victorious story with with a great ending. Tonight, I want to look at this through through a different avenue. I don't want to look at a story. I want to ask and then answer a question with you tonight, and that is, what is there to hope for? I want you to think about that for a second. What is there to hope for? How would you answer that question? Someone comes and says, well, what, what do you have to hope for? What do you have to look forward to? What are you, what are you longing for? That's what hope is. Hope is a, a longing, an expectation of what's to come. As a Christian, what, what, what is your hope? Where is your hope? It's a deep question, isn't it? I mean, it makes you pause and think, as a Christian, what do we have to look forward to? What is our hope? And honestly, if we're being honest with ourselves, we ought to be able to answer this question, right? For God's people. You see, Peter wrote in 1 Peter 3 and verse 15, Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account, look there, for the hope that's in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. That's what he says you need to be ready. Our friends and our neighbors and our coworkers, they're going to have questions. But of all the things you need to be ready to defend or give an answer for, it's, it's the hope you have in you. In other words, what's so good about being a Christian? Why is it good to belong to Christ? I'll tell you the answer to this question. You can find the answer to this question. The answer to this question is our source of strength and hope and comfort in this life. The answer to this question is the heart of evangelism because you're sharing with someone, this is why it's good to belong to Jesus. This is why we we are part of God's family. But the answer to this question, brethren, is why we are more than conquerors. This is why. There's a lot of ways we could answer it, but I want to look at Peter tonight. I want to look at the first few verses of 1 Peter, because Peter, I believe, he opens up his epistle by describing things that everyone wants. And I can say it as that. There are certain things in this life everyone wants it. It doesn't matter if they're a Christian or a non-Christian, if they're old or they're young, everyone wants the same things in life. We all are looking for the same things in life. The difference is how we go looking for them. Some go trying to fill that gap in work or in money or in relationships, and they won't find it. But the truth of the matter is, the things between us and our neighbors, that's the difference, is, is, is very few and far between. We all want and look for the same things. Let's read it together. We're going to read 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. Listen for it as we're reading. What is it that everyone longs for, hopes for? What is it that everyone wants? 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. You who are protected by the power of God through faith for salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. What do we want? What are the things that everyone wants and longs for? Well, I think we can start by saying everyone wants a family. Everyone longs for family. He calls them the God and Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. There's not a more important relationship in one's life than their family. Our closest bonds, our most trusted individuals, the people that we lean on for wisdom and guidance, it's it's family. I mean, the people that we want around in our, in our greatest occasions, with births or weddings or graduation, it's family. The people we want by our side in our, in our lowest moments, our darkest moments, it's family. You know, you know as well as I do, not everyone knows what it's like to have a family. Not everyone knows what it's like to have a mom and a dad. Not everyone knows what it's like to have siblings, to have grandparents, to have cousins, and, and to have family surrounding them. Every, every Wednesday for a period of a year when I was in Chattanooga, I was blessed to go to the Hamilton County um, Correction Facility. It was the prison. It was the prison is what it was. It took about a year to get the smell out of the nose because every Wednesday, it was, it was amazing. It was just a side moment. Like Wednesday would come, and I'm here in Texas, and the smell would return. Isn't that weird how the brain can trick itself? Anyway, so every Wednesday I went to the Hamilton County Prison, and I got to speak in front of a group of around 30 men, and I got to preach Jesus. 
I got to talk about Jesus. You know what's amazing is that that crowd was very different. They were different in their ethnicities, different in their ages, different as to why they were in there or how long they were going to be there. But there was one common link between the majority of all of the men. You know what it was? They didn't have dad in the home. They didn't have a father. Either they didn't have a father, period, or the man in their home wasn't the man he needed to be. I mean, just think about it for a moment. Why is it young men turn themselves over to violence at a young age? Why is it young ladies sell themselves in their bodies? Why is it young people throw themselves in the gangs? Well, it's because there's something in them that they're missing. There's something deep and fundamental in their life that's missing. It's that longing to belong. I want to know I belong somewhere. I want to know that I'm wanted and I'm loved. And for many of them, it's missing. But you notice what Peter says. He says, there's a God who's not just the Lord of Jesus, the master of Jesus. He is his father. And if you look at verse 17 of this context, look what he says about us. And if you address as father the one who impartially judges according to each man's work. You see, that is when we obey the gospel, when we submit our lives to Jesus, it's not just that God is our creator and he is. The relationship changes when we obey the gospel. It goes from creator and creation, from king and servant to now father and child. Paul says that when you obeyed the gospel, you were adopted into his family. Adopted, chosen, you belong. So now you will wear my name and you will eat my food and you will sit at my table and you will share in my inheritance and you, you will live in my home because you are mine. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants to know I belong somewhere. There's someone who loves me. There's someone who's waiting for me. And the thing is, when someone obeys the gospel, it's not just that they get a father, an amazing, eternal father who loves perfectly. We get a whole family. 1 Timothy 3.15, Paul calls the church the household of the living God. I'll tell you one of my favorite scenes. I know you've seen it too. When someone comes forward and is baptized, especially Sunday morning, when they come out of this door, what's waiting for them? Nothing. <laughs> now you know, there's a long line of people, the whole line of brethren, and they can't wait to hug on them and say, oh, we're so proud of you, and we love you. Welcome to the family. Can't wait to get to know you better. And so when someone obeys Christ, you know what they get? Family. Family. And everyone wants family. Everyone wants that. Everyone wants renewal. He says that he has caused us to be born again. Have you ever had a day in which you wish in which you wish the reset button really existed. You just push it and start that day over. The things you said, the things you did, I just wish, wish we could go back and let's do this one all over again. I heard a prayer one said, he said, Dear Lord, I've been good today. I've not been mean or crude or rude. I've actually been a really nice person. But Lord, it's 1130 and I have to get out of bed and I need all the help I can get in Jesus' name, amen. You ever had those days I just, I wish I could start over. <laughs> I mean, how many of you with any age of you, of you wish, you know, I wish I could go back to high school, back to college with what I know now. Things would be really different if I did. You know, we, we don't get this in life. Whatever you want to call it, renewal, a second chance. We, we don't get that very often. Because if you mess up at work, you're fired. If you mess up at school, you're expelled. If you mess up outside, if you break the laws, you go to prison. And maybe you've, you've tasted this, felt this. If you break a relationship, if you break trust, sometimes reconciliation is not offered. It's not on the table. But God says, when you come to me, when you obey me, it's not I'm just wiping the slate clean. Peter says, those who are in Christ, look at the language, you're born again. You're new, brand new, renewed. You're a brand new person in Christ. Peter would use, or Paul would use the language of a new creature in Christ. New from the inside out. New thinking, new hope, new vision, new, new Lord and Master, new direction in your life. You're new. Now listen to me. You have people all around you in your life, and they would give anything to hear this tonight. It's not too late for you. That is, no matter what you've done and how many times you've done it, it's not too late. There is a second chance. There exists a chance to start over fresh and start over new. That is, no matter how broken the past may be, 
No matter how, how dark the pages of your past may be, there's a chance for a renewal. You can end better than how you started. God's not done with you yet. In fact, maybe for us tonight, we know this to be true. But maybe we need to be reminded. We the redeemed. We God's children who, who stumble and fall. Remember that when we sin, God's not done with you yet. And so when we turn from God and we, and we find ourselves walking away from the path we know we need to be on, John says that if we, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There is real renewal in Christ. And everyone wants that. To know it's not too late, no matter what I've done and how many times I've done it and how bad it is, there's someone who's willing to give me another chance. A chance to start over fresh, a chance to, to try again, a chance to come back and be what I need to be. That's found in God. Everyone wants eternity. I love the phrase he says uh, that we have a living hope, an, inher- an inheritance which is imperishable, undefiled, and will not fade away. Those are amazing verses, amazing phrases. Everything, even the good things, end. You notice that the best day you ever had came to an end. Best vacation you were ever on, a week at Disney, two weeks in the, in the mountains, eventually it came to an end, and your wallets were glad. The best book you've ever read, even Sir, uh, Harry Potter and its seven, 15,000 pages long, it came to an end. Or for the older folks, maybe the uh, Gone with the Wind and its 15 VHS tapes, eventually it, it came to an end. You start your job one day with such hope and ambition, and then comes the last day in retirement. It it came to an end. And even our bodies, we know it. Oh, but we take the vitamins, and we eat good, and we use the cream and the hair dye, but we know eventually this body is always, it's only going one way. It's going to the grave, because here's the truth. Everything around us, even the good things, it comes to an end. Now, here's the truth. God made us wanting things to last. Ecclesiastes Solomon says in verse 11 of chapter 3 that he has set eternity in our heart. That is, he made us with a longing for eternity. But you know what the irony is? How did Solomon begin this chapter? In chapter 3 and verse 2, he says there's a day to be born and a day to die, or a time to be born and a time to die. We long for things to last, and yet everything around us dies. Everything around us ends. But Peter says there's something. No, there's something you can have, and it won't end. It won't fade. It's imperishable. It'll last forever. In fact, notice with me why. Look at verse 3. Notice why what we have in Christ lasts forever. He says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. What? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why is our hope everlasting? Why does it not perish? Because this living hope was given by a living Lord. He lives. He conquered the grave. Paul would say in the book of Romans 6 verse 9, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer, look at that phrase, is master over him. I love that phrase. Jesus submitted to death once. Calvary. He gave himself to death for us He's not going to die again. Death is not master over him. Revelation 1.18 says he holds the keys of death and Hades. And so if that Lord says your hope is imperishable, if that Lord says your hope goes beyond the grave, it lasts. It stands. What that means is I could lose everything. I could lose everything in this life. All the good things. All the things that matter most to me. I could even lose my own life. But my hope remains. A hope of living with God, my hope of forgiveness, my hope of eternal life. That doesn't end at the grave. Paul looked at earlier in this chapter, verse 5, he looked at us, and he says, if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Jesus, the living Lord, offers us a living hope because one day, though we pass through the door of death, we will live too. We'll live on. Here's one more thing. We all want security. He says, you who are protected by the power of God, in verse 5, everyone wants security, especially, especially today. Now, I'm not going to ask because I, 
I kind of know. I have a feeling by now. I kind of know. It, it's amazing. It's amazing the change. The change in our times and even change for my family where we live. People pack. They're packing. They're ready for action at any moment. In fact, I tell people when I go on gospel meetings, I say, are you guys safe in Texas? And I say, we're in Texas. I mean, if anyone comes in, this is an okay corral here. Everyone's packing. The wives are packing. The kids are packing. Yeah, we're ready. Do you know why that is? I mean, there used to be a time we would send our kids off to school, and the only thing we thought about was, I got to pick them up at 2, 2.30 to 3. We send our kids off to college, and the only thing plaguing our mind is, have they eaten? Are they doing their laundry? Are they going to class? We go to see a movie, and the only thing that bugs us is, did I get enough popcorn? Did I get a big enough Coke? That's not today. That's not today. I mean, our world has been shattered with terror. And so we're shaking with fear, and we lock our doors, and we double-check the locks, and we protect ourselves where we go because something very important to us is that we want to be safe. We want to keep ourselves safe. But can we be honest tonight? You can buy the -the state-of-the-art, most secure system for your home, your own individual body, but there's only so much you can do to keep yourself safe from dangers that inevitably come, most often when you least expect it. But there is a God who says, I'll keep you safe. The hands that hold the world are saying, I'll I'll hold you and I'll protect you. Like the psalmist would say, he, not, not my sword or my armies, David could say, God is my refuge and my strength. A very person to help in times of trouble. You know what this does not mean? Protected by God? It doesn't mean you're never going to get hurt the rest of your life. You're never going to face another storm the rest of your life. That's not what it means. What it means is even if I face a storm, I'm not going to have to face it alone. And even though I go through the valleys of the shadow of death, I'm not going to fear because he's with me, with his rod and with his staff. And what it means is even though I might face harm, And I might lose my wealth or even my health or even my life. God is able to protect what matters most to me. Hear this. There is nothing in all existence, existence on earth, over the earth, and any demonic, powerful hell that exists that can take me from God. Yes, I can leave God. I can walk away from God. But if I'm walking with the Savior, if I'm right with Him, nothing can take me from Him. I'm protected by his power. So what do we want? What does everybody want? Well, everyone wants family. I want to know that I'm loved and that I belong. Everyone wants renewal, a second chance, a chance to start over again, that someone's allowing me, even though I've messed up, to, to try again. We want eternity, something that will last beyond, beyond a moment, and then we want safety. We want to know that we're safe, safe and secure. Let me ask you something. Do we have this today? Would you say we have this in some measure today? I think we could say we do. We're a family. We are a family in Christ today. And in a real sense, we are renewed. We are the forgiven. We are the redeemed. Our sins have been forgiven. And there's a sense, go with me here, there's a sense in which we have eternal life today. In that 1 John 5, 13, these things I've written these, uh, to, to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. And so, and so we have it guaranteed to us today. And of course we're protected by God, even today. But I want you to look at verse 4. I want you to look at one thing Peter says in verse 4. He says that you are to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away. Look at that last phrase there. He says, that which is reserved in heaven for you. So in other words, while we have this today, there's a sense in which the full expression, the full reality of what we hope for will be found when we all go to heaven. Can you think about that for a moment with me? We long for family. Hey, brethren, there's going to be a day when we live with God. You think of John's picture in Revelation 21. He will dwell among them. And I know what you're thinking. Well, God's with us now. God is everywhere. He's here. There's not a place God cannot be. No, listen to what he's saying. 
there's going to come a day and God will dwell among us to the point where he will say, we're going to see his face. We will see his face. I know we've heard that. Do you you know what that means, though? We will see his face. No one has seen his face and lived. Everyone wants to see God, the invisible God. But one day he says, we're going to see him. We're going to look at him face to face. And we're going to hear audibly with our ears his voice as he calls our name and looks at us in our eyes. We're going to be there with God. Unlike ever before. And I know I'm looking at a spiritual family And there's going to be some people there we haven't seen in a long time. Some family members that we've had to say goodbye to or see you later to. And that family reunion will be like nothing else we've ever seen. Because we'll pick up in a moment as if no time has passed. And there we won't be separated again from them at all. That's family. We long for renewal, a second chance. Do you know how we are pictured? God pictures us in heaven. It's not he says, oh, Chelsea Jordan over here. Do you know what he did in his 20s when he was in college? Jordan, you remember that? Here, let me put it up on the Jumbotron. Let me show you what Jordan did in his 20s when he was at college. You're not going to believe this. Look at what he did. How, how embarrassing. Do you know how we're pictured? John is told, come. And I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And what follows is this long description of beautiful gems and diamonds and stones. The bride is pictured in absolute beauty. No thought, not even a mention, not even a hint of any stain, of any filth, of any sin on this person. It is complete and Full renewal. There is no darkness. There is no evil. There is no sin. In God's home. We long for eternity. That which will last. Well, the day we go to heaven is the day death dies. There will be no more death. In fact, how do we sing that with amazing grace? When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we have no less days to sing God's praise than when we first began. 10,000 years won't scratch the beginning, not even the surface of our time with God. It'll last forever. It is the perfect day that never comes to an end. And then we long for protection, to be safe. Revelation 20 is a confusing chapter for many people, but it ought to be a chapter we remember. It has a specific purpose for us. Revelation 20 is the end of our enemy, the end of Satan. It describes how Satan is destined for the lake of fire. Good brethren, I I want you to remember that. Satan does a lot of things to make life hard. But one of the things he does most often to us is remind us of our past. He is called the accuser for a reason. And so one of the things he likes to do in your heart and in your mind is remind you of your long list of sins, of your dark history and your dark past, and do nothing but sow doubt and skepticism and fear in your heart. Listen to me. The next time Satan reminds you of your past, you open the Bible and remind him of his future. He's destined for the lake of fire. There will come a day when our enemy is done. And look on the screen. That day, there's no longer any death. There's no mourning, there is no crying, there is no pain, there is nothing that would cause any harm. No temptation, no evil, not in God's home. So we ask the question tonight, what do we have to hope for? What is there to hope for? You know, the answer to this question, in many ways, is for those who are not Christians, why belong to Jesus? Why give your life to God? Let, let, me, let me show you why it's so good to give your life to Jesus. But tonight, the question is for us, for God's people. Not to learn something new, but to be reminded of something that we tend to forget. One of my favorite scenes in the Bible, I've known it for a long time, but was reminded two years ago when Ricky and I did our blog through Numbers and Deuteronomy. And it has become ingrained in my heart. Uh, When I read it or think about it, 
it's, it's tender to me. I'm, I'm moved almost to tears every time I, I read it. When Moses ends his life, he's led God's people to the promised land. He did his job. He did what he was supposed to do. And so he brought them to the east side of the Jordan, and God calls him up. He calls them up to, to Mount Nebo, the top of Mount Pisgah, and it's there that Moses is going to die. And it's, it's hard it's hard to read that, because for so long that was Moses' job, his dream, getting to the promised land, seeing the promised land, claiming the promised land, and then he gets so close after everything he's gone through, and there he, he knows his journey is going to end. But God calls him up, and instead of killing Moses on the spot right there on the mountain, he tells him to look, and he looks out from that mountain and he sees the promised land. This is a modern day picture of perhaps what Moses would have seen. I mean, can you imagine? Before he dies, he gets to see this promised land. And not just see it, Deuteronomy 34 and verse 1 says that the Lord showed him all of the land. Can you imagine getting a tour by God? Moses, let me tell you about the land. Those hills over there, do you see the hills on the east? They're going to love that. Do you see the river that flows? Do you see how lush and how green? He showed them the land. But you see, God did more than just show them the land. God showed Moses his promise. I promised this a long time ago. I want you to see for your eyes this was it. This is what I was talking about. He did more than just show Moses the land. He showed him Israel's future. Moses, can you see it with your eyes? Can you imagine it through faith? Can you see the people occupied in this land? Can you see them spreading out, claiming, building, making this theirs? Can, can you see it through your eyes of faith? He did more than just show him land. He gave him hope. And so before he took him home, he said, I want you to see this promised land. Will you do something for me tonight? Can you take your bag, your backpack, your baggage? And I want you to wear it for a minute, just a couple minutes. Everything in your life that's going on right now, you might have suppressed it while we're here, put on the smiles. Just for a minute, can you wear it for me? What's going on in your life? You stressed? You're bothered. Is there someone under your skin? Is there someone annoying you? Are they here? <laughs> How's work? Is it tough? Are the demands really, really hard? Is your boss unruly or unyielding, unmerciful? You have to get things done. Do you have a deadline due and you're sitting here and you're wondering how long is he going to be? I have to get it done. Homework to get done? Are you bothered about your family? Do you have aging parents? Is that weighing on you? What's keeping you up right now? Can you feel it? I can. Kind of makes you want to hunch a little bit. It hurts. Is there something that's really troubling you? Are you bothered? Will you carry it with me? And go up Mount Nebo? Just, just a minute. Just a minute. And just carry your weight. I want you to feel it, though. Are you stressed? Are you lonely? Are you hurting? Are you frustrated? Are you annoyed? Are you bothered? Are you lonely? What, what, what are you feeling? Feel that with me for a moment. I feel it. There's some frustrations I have, absolutely. And some fears. Wear it with me for a minute. And let's climb Mount Nebo. Don't take it off. I want you for a minute. Can you look at something with me? You can close your eyes if you want to or just, just with your eyes of faith. Will you, will you look with me for a minute just across the Jordan? We're not looking at Canaan. <laughs> We're looking at home. Just a sneak peek over into heaven. I mean, what do you see? Your first glimpse into heaven, what, what, what pops in your mind? What are you hearing? What are you imagining? Being, being there, 
if you can realize that you're there. As you walk in in this amazing place, as, as you're gazing through your eyes, and I know you can't believe it. I can't either, because there's David. The David. I don't even know what to say to him. I have a lot of questions, though. And there's Moses. I know that's Moses. I know it. I've never met him, but there is Moses. I see him there, and I see Noah. This is unreal. And there is the Apostle Paul. I see Paul. I see him. And Peter, this is crazy. I don't even know where to begin. Look at all these heroes. And I see my grandmother. And I see Riley. And I see Bill. I see some people I haven't seen in a long time. Man, and some of their hugs, it's like I haven't, it's like I just saw them yesterday. Nothing is missed. And they say, catch me up on life. Let me hear about your journey. I know it's been a long time. I'm anxious. Tell me about your story. And Job comes and says, I want to hear too. Can I hear? <laughs> Man, I can't wait to tell these guys about my story and how I lived. But something's really bright. And I have to wait because I have to see. I know that's why I'm here. And he's there. He is what this is all about. It's, it's all him, the light, the brilliance, what, what, what this room is, is leading towards. He, he is there. I don't have words. I've known about you for a long time. And I've prayed to you and, and thought about you and... I don't know if I should stand or fall or sing or I'm not sure what the right protocol is right now. But he just grabs me and hugs me and says, I've known about you for a long time too. I knew about you when I was on the cross. And boy, I'm so proud that you're here. You're going to love it here. I'm overwhelmed. I don't even know where to begin. I think, man, I just, I wish, I wish this day would never come to an end. Because I've got so much I want to do and so many people I want to talk to and, and so many people I haven't seen. And I'm overwhelmed with the fact that I'm here. <laughs> I mean, I always believed I would be here, but it's, it's here. I'm, I'm standing here. And I realize it's, <laughs> this is just the beginning. This is the beginning of the best day. It's never going to come to an end. Let me ask you something. How heavy is that bag? How heavy is your bag? It's amazing when we set our minds on things above, not on things here on earth. Our cares and our stresses and our anxieties almost seem to melt away, fading, because they pale in comparison as to where we're going. Do you know why we're more than conquerors, good brethren? It's because of what is and what is to come. What is is amazing. What is is the blood of Christ. What is is real strength and real hope and real guidance today but this is not all that there is. And the reason we're more than conquerors is because of what is to come. So Paul says we don't lose heart. We don't give up. We don't throw in the towel. He says, though our outer man is decaying, yet our inner man is being renewed day by day. For momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight of glory far beyond all comparison. He says, while we look down at the things which are seen, but the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal. Those things which are not seen, they're eternal. I hope tonight, if anything, maybe I just reminded you of the hope you have in Christ. And the next day, the next time life starts to get hard, and you start to get frustrated, and you start to get angry, I just hope you'll take it, and you'll take your bag, and you'll climb your Mount Nebo, and you'll just look. You look over to Jordan. Not at what might come. Not at what could come. But brethren, what is to come? What is to come in Christ? And if you're not in Christ, you can change that tonight. Because heaven is a prepared place for prepared people. 
If you submit your life to Jesus, you turn from your sin, you be baptized in the blood of the Lamb, and you too can have that glorious hope of that promised land beyond the Jordan. And if we can help you with that tonight, right here is where you need to be. Let's do it right now. Let's stand and let's sing.